Welcome, 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 welcome everybody to our continuing discussion with scholars, thinkers, philosophers, professors, academics, uh, media people, anybody from the left, from the right, we don't care. We're trying to get intelligent perspectives and provide them directly to you, the public, so you can do this thing that used to be popular when I was high school called Think for Yourself and Make Up Your Own Opinion. With us today is Lane Kinworthy. He's the Yankalovich Endowed Chair Professor. Uh, he works at the Department of Sociology at UC San Diego. He studied the causes and consequences of living standards, poverty, inequality, mobility, employment, economic growth, social policy, taxes, public opinion, and politics in the United States and other affluent countries. His books include Would Democratic Socialism Be Better? Social Democratic Capitalism, The Good Society, How Big Should Our Government Be? Social Democratic America, Progress for the Poor, Jobs with Equality, Egalitarian Capitalism, and In Search of National Economic Success. You can find out more at his website at lanekinworthy.net. Today, we were going to talk about this essay called, Is America Too Polarized? Uh, Professor, before we start, did I get anything wrong about your uh, your background or bio? Do we need to correct something? No, you got it all right. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Um, let's get right to the meat and potatoes. You wrote this essay in April 2023. Uh, you're a professor, but you're also an American. You have two eyes and you live here. What was going on in America? Uh, talk to me as if I woke up from a cave. Why did you write this essay and why did you write it in April? What's going on? Why did that seem like something that need to be discussed at that particular time? Well, actually, I should say I wrote the original version of it some time ago. I can't remember when I, I first did this, but this is part of this Good Society book. It's sort of an online book that I've been working on for 10 or 15 years or so and steadily building. And so I, I wrote this because I think it's important. And one of the things I'm interested in is politics and democracy. And I think this is critical to a healthy community, a good society, a good country. Uh, and so the April 2023 date is just the, the latest update of it. But I will say that I, I do think the topic of polarization has become increasingly relevant since I originally wrote it. I wasn't sure when I wrote it that that would be true. Sometimes politics changes in particular ways and people get alarmed about it. And then you look back 10 or 20 years later and think, oh, well, that was kind of interesting. But it was just a temporary blip. Polarization, at least so far, hasn't proved to be like that. It's it's not a bit more enduring and it's arguably you know, ex accelerated, I suppose, or at least increased since I first wrote that. Did you um, start? But, but okay, why? Well, well, just real quick, I know it's a little bit difficult for you to, to guess, but did you start writing the essay 20 years ago, 10 years ago, or more like five years ago? Do you have a rough yeah, approximation? Yeah, it, it would have been it would have been five to 10. So probably in the middle of the 2010s, some somewhere in that neighborhood. I'm, okay. I'm pretty sure I wrote the first version of it before the 2016 election. Okay, so when Obama was president, roughly, uh, there was a lot of academic research coming out during the time that Obama was president. Apparently, people were shocked that we had the least productive Congress in American history ever. By that time, they couldn't pass any bills. And then there was the debt ceiling clock that they almost uh, ran up against the rock three times. And you saw a lot of people scared in academics. So I'm wondering if it was roughly around that time. Maybe it is. Um, I'm sorry, uh, please, Professor. Why is polarization an issue? Is it bad? Uh, what's going on in America today? So good question. And I'm a little less certain than I was even a couple of years ago that it's bad. Uh, I, I think there are two, two main ways in which people seem to think it's bad. And when I say people, I mean academics, uh, folks who are deeply involved in politics and ordinary citizens. So one is that it, it seems to have hardened our lives and uh, uh, increased a certain level of meanness uh, in the way we think about our lives and we think about people we know or think about people we might get close to or might not. You know, maybe one of the best signals of this is this question that pollsters sometimes ask, which is, 
would you be happy or upset if your child married uh, X, Y, or Z? And you know, but this is all kinds right. of categories. But but recently they've been asking a Democrat or Republican. And you know, if you're a Democrat uh, and you're asked if your child marries a Republican, a lot of Americans now say they'd be deeply upset. Uh, you know, more than. Uh, if they married someone with a different religious affiliation or a different race or ethnic group or, you know, native born, non-native born. And that that's fairly new uh, and and striking. Um, it's also, I think, important to note, and I here I don't know the degree to which it's a real problem. Um, and I also, of course, don't know how long this is going to last, but political and or party identity seems to have superseded a lot of other kinds of identities. I don't, I don't know exactly when that happened. I don't know the degree to which it's uh, true, but Americans seem increasingly to, to first and foremost think of themselves as liberals or conservatives, Democrats or Republicans, rather than, again, a member of a religious affiliation, a Californian, a Boston Red Sox fan, what, whatever. I mean, we have lots and lots of different identities, but uh, political orientation or political party affiliation seems to become increasingly important. And one consequence of that is that it seems to determine uh, more and more of our views on particular issues. So it's long been known to, to political scientists um, that most people don't care much about politics. Uh, they may or may not go to vote, but they don't pay a whole lot of attention. Um, and so they don't have strong opinions on most issues. Um, and in the past, what that meant is that they could potentially be persuaded to, to change their view or just to take a, a position for the first time on some issue that they hadn't really thought too much about, whether it was widely regarded, regarded as important or not. Nowadays, people are much more likely, or, or again, seem much more likely, I, I'm not certain of the, the magnitude of this effect, uh, seem much more likely to simply take their cue from their political affiliation, from their party or their orientation and whoever they, they perceive to be the leader of their particular orientation. So if you don't really know what you think about the uh, debt ceiling fight, you simply look to your party and they give you a, a ready-made answer. And then people, for whatever reason, seem to feel strongly committed that that's the, the right position to take. Or, you know, you don't, you don't know whether you think masking during COVID is a good idea or vaccinations are safe, whatever it might yeah. be. And yeah. So you, you simply take your cue from the party and then all of a sudden you now have a, a strong view on an issue that you don't really know very much about, but um, now people seem increasingly prepared to to get into arguments um, because because they do have a position which they you know they simply take from their party or, or their they repeat the talking points they repeat the soundbite from right. that they've heard okay I've heard that a lot right. of people going can't even have conversations with people and if you do have disagreements with them you can't even have real disagreements with them because all they know is the thirty second soundbite they heard from the news station about their side and that's no, this is a good idea because. Blah, 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 Okay, but why do you think that? I don't know. You know, this, I, here's my soundbite. That's all I got. I did want to point out a few statistics to back you up. This is from uh, the Pew Research Center, October 5th, 2017. Partisan divide on political values grows even wider. This is in 2017, six years ago. And they were saying exactly what you were saying, Professor. A partisan divides over political values widen. Other gaps remain more modest. It was showing how from 1994 to 2017, race religion, uh, university attendance, education, age, gender, the amount of difference did not change at all. Stayed constant from 1994 to 2017. So the amount of division we had in 94 on those issues, same amount we had in 2017. But if you look at political party ideology, it goes from about 15% to 36%. It's that line shooting straight up, not with the others massively out of line with all the other ideologies and totally backing up what you're saying that roughly since 1992 people have gotten over the race issue the gender issue etc yeah we still have problems of course but you look at that party polarization it's that black line that's pulling away from the trend it is massively out of whack with the way that americans feel on everything else we've basically been cool on everything else 
but party polarization. I also showed the chart. There's an article from Time Magazine. Um, well, I won't try to bring it up again. And it was saying, you know, people don't date outside their political thing. It was uh, 30% in 2012, and then it was over half by 2020. Over half of Americans by 2020 said, hell no, I won't date anybody that's outside my politics. And this chart also shows political ideology supersedes all other forms of ideology. Um, is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Yes, but let me let me mention just two other considerations that that might bear on how we think about whether polarization is good, bad, both, something in between. So one is that, uh, and and I think this is often lost in uh, especially the journalistic commentary uh, on the issue. So polarization actually has two elements. One is movement of people away from the center on whatever it might be. Uh, you can talk about polarization, not only with respect to politics, but lots of other stuff. But anyway, so one, uh, one element of it is moving away from the center toward the extremes. And the other is sorting more cleanly into two separate groups. And these can go together, but they don't have to go together. And so let me just explain how this works with American citizens and, and voters. So we have very much sorted ourselves more cleanly and clearly into the two political parties and also to the broader political orientations, but especially the parties. It used to be the case that you could be a conservative, especially if you were in the South, and nonetheless a diehard Democrat. This was I true for that. much of the middle of the 20th century. And similarly, you could be sort of center left, uh, but nevertheless a Republican. Uh, the, the name for those kinds of people back then um, was Rockefeller Republicans after Nelson Rockefeller. Mm. It was the sort of most readily identifiable uh, national kind of centrist Republican in the 1950s and 1960s. So that's um, very seldom true anymore. Most Americans who think of themselves on the left side of the political spectrum now are Democrats. And most Americans who think of themselves on the right side now are Republicans. Um, when we think about, just as an aside, when we think about elected representatives, so people elected to the House and the Senate, um, that separation is full and complete. In both the House and the Senate, there is no Democrat who is to the right of any Republican. And um, in, in the population, that's close to true, but not fully true. Anyway, it's way more true than it was uh, several generations ago. At the same time, the public opinion um, polling by Gallup, the General Social Survey, the Pew Research Center, the American National Election Studies, and, and others suggests that Americans haven't really moved away from the center on their policy views. Most Americans are in the center when it comes to political orientation and on lots of specific uh, issues as well. And as best we can tell, going back in time, there really hasn't been any movement away from that. It's not as though lots of people have moved from centrists, again, in general political orientation. Are you conservative, moderate, or liberal? Or on specific issues. It's just that we've sorted uh, very cleanly into the parties. And that still matters a lot, but it's just worth noting that it's not as though we as citizens or voters have become a nation of extremists. Uh, it's just that we're much more cleanly sorted into these two parties. So that's one thing worth mentioning. And and I don't know if that's necessarily good or bad or neither. It's not so clear to me that it would be a terrible thing if we had more of us uh, out on the edges on particular policy views or if, you know, if more of us considered ourselves extremely liberal as opposed to mildly liberal or extremely conservative as opposed to mildly conservative. But anyway, that it, that is what it is. The one other thing I wanted to mention and really emphasize, and, and this I think maybe is the most concerning uh, consequence of polarization is gridlock in the federal government. So now that we have two much more cohesive, cleanly sorted parties, uh, it's not too surprising that it's more difficult uh, for elected representatives in the, the two parties to uh, agree on things. 
And in a particular political context, uh, that makes it much more harder, much more difficult to pass legislation or to change legislation. Um, the political context in which that's true is one in which there are a variety of what political scientists often call veto points. That is to say, when uh, there are various points in the policymaking process where if someone opposes, they have the, the power, the authority to block it. So we have two legislative bodies, a House of Representatives and a Senate. Most other rich democratic countries don't have that. Some of them do have two houses, but one of them is mostly symbolic. It doesn't really have any decision-making power. We also have a separately elected executive. Most other countries don't have that. France does, but, but most don't. So essentially, most, in most other countries, there's just a parliament, and the prime minister is whoever is the leader of the, the largest party or, or the, the coalition that has the majority in the parliament. But they're not elected separately, and so it's pretty easy for the majority to pass more or less whatever it wants. There's a, a judiciary and there's judicial review so that the, you know, the, the judiciary can nullify a, um, a law that's passed. But it's much easier to pass things. So here in the United States, if you're the minority party at a moment in time, but, uh, but you happen to hold that a majority in the House of Representatives, or if you've got a majority on the Supreme Court or in the Senate, really because of the filibuster, in most cases, all you need is 41 seats out of the 100, you can block almost everything. Uh, if you're cohesive and, and determined to block things. So that, in a context of heavy polarization, is a recipe for uh, for gridlock, for making it very difficult to, to get things done. Um, it is cleanly it's set even, parties. Yeah, exactly. It's very hard now to, not impossible, but but much more difficult now to, to reach any sort of compromise because most people in the Democratic Party who are elected representatives, that this is true of most citizens too, but, but here I'm focusing on the elected representatives, they want different things from most people in the Republican Party. And so they're, they're not all that willing to or interested in, in compromising. Um, I want to add, though, and, and here this gets to, you know, maybe later we would talk about possible solutions or ways out absolutely, of this problem. But, but I guess I want to... I want to hint at one here by, by mentioning another important fact about contemporary American politics, which is very, I think, very often uh, ignored or overlooked in these conversations, which is that it matters a lot that we just happen to be at this moment in time, something close to a 50-50 nation at the national level. That is to say, we've got these two main political parties and each of them has you know, roughly equal support among the voters. The reason that matters is if uh, if we didn't have that, it'd be a, m a lot more likely that one of the two parties would have consistent majorities in most of our decision making bodies. And so it wouldn't really be an obstacle to passing legislation that we're polarized or that we have all these veto points because you know one party would win most elections and it could more or less do whatever it wants. And the reason we know that's true is because you can see that in a lot of our states. So, you know, we, we have these 50 states, most of them are not evenly split like we are as a country. In California, for example, the Republican Party, it exists, but it has no power at all in the state government. And so California is just as polarized in all the respects that I mentioned as the country as a whole. You know, most people on the left side of the spectrum are Democrats. Most people on the right side are Republicans. Uh, Californians are very cleanly sorted into those two parties. So the parties are quite ideologically cohesive. But it just happens that in California, the liberals and progressives way, way outnumber the conservatives and Republicans. So Democrats more or less run the show. Um, it's a, a bit True. of a fluke that, that that's not the case at the national level. We just happen to be very close to 50-50 at this point in time. And, you know, there's no necessary reason to assume that that's going to continue forever. That's probably been more the exception than the rule throughout the country's history. You know, there was a long period in the middle of the 20th century where the country was much more democratic than Republican. And Democrats weren't as cohesive back then, but, but they were able to pass a lot of legislation, even though, you know, we still had all these veto points back then. Uh, so anyway, um, 
I just think it's really important to note that feature of our, our national politics sure. right now and the way that that, I think, contributes to uh, the possibility of gridlock, uh, the, the yeah. difficulty in passing legislation. Let me repeat back what I think I'm hearing, and then I want to ask you two clarifying questions. So I think what you're getting at, and some people have gotten this. So in America, we have what's called the winner-take-all system. I won. I won by 51 percent. Oh, did 49 percent, that's almost half of you, want something? Well, tough. I won. Now it's what I want, and I can say I have a mandate. If you go to Europe, Iraq, any of the democracies sponsored by America, they don't have that system at all. They have what's called a multi-party system. So they have four or five parties, and the parties have to join together to form a coalition government to get over about 60, 65 percent, maybe 70 percent of the votes. So when they have this coalition government, they come in with the majority. There is no possible chance that you could have 51 percent came in in England and now we're running. That's They view that as madness in Europe and Japan and most of the world, and they don't follow the democratic system we have here because they view it as inherently polarizing because you get to this 50-50 split and somebody goes, I got 51% of the vote. I represent everybody. No, you don't. And in Europe, they don't do that. The questions I wanted to ask you was, are Repub I think you're saying Republicans are roughly half of the USA. Is that a fair statement or conservatives or people who think that way are, are roughly half of the country? Well, that's what we see in elections since around 2000, okay. you know, all of the elections, apart from 2008, when the economy fell apart right right before it, all of the elections, for, at least for president, and in most cases for the Senate and the House have been quite close. Okay. I just wanted to ask, it's not about me, it's about you. We've had people come on here and go, Republicans are some tiny fraction of the American electorate. And uh, Democrats are the clear majority. And the only way they're able to get anything is by tricking and stealing elections and everything. I'm like, I think they're more to half the population. So I wanted to hear from somebody who could actually talk about that. Thank you. Uh, clarifying question. I think what you're saying is the voters are not more extreme. The parties are more cleanly segregated. But the problem may be that because the parties are so cleanly segregated, you don't have a liberal Republican, you don't have a conservative Democrat you may never get legislation that's actually what the average American people want. Maybe the average American people are willing to come to terms on something, but because the parties are in control and they're so polarized from each other, you may never actually get that legislation, even if the people want that. Is that roughly correct? That's the, that's the big worry. Um, okay. Now, how true is it is a, a separate question and, and really important. And I think, uh, my, my take at the moment is that it's not quite as true as I used to assume for a while. And I think most people who I've heard in this kind of conversation seem to imply that it's true. Um, and so let me let me elaborate a little bit. Um, there are a variety of ways in which it's still possible to make policy in the country. And we see some cross party compromise on some issues in the federal government. Um, leaders of the two parties don't often like to talk about it because a lot of our politics now works by uh, negative partisanship. That is to say, uh, the argument for why you should vote for me or for my party is not so much we're, what we're going to do, but, but how bad the other party is going to be if they win the election. And so it, it doesn't really help most candidates or the leaders of the, the two parties at the national level to trumpet um, bipartisan legislation that they passed, mm. like the Semiconductor Act uh, a year or so ago. Uh, some Republicans voted for this, uh, you know, probably for, for good reason. But in any event, it was bipartisan. Other things are passed. They just don't get a lot of discussion, um, again, because it's not in, in most people's interests, or at least their perceived interest, to, to talk a lot about it. They want to talk about how awful the other party is. But anyway, so that's one possibility. The other is the, the reconciliation procedure. So even with the filibuster, uh, it's possible to pass stuff through the Senate without having 60 of the 100 seats. Uh, one or two times a year, you can use this procedure called reconciliation. That's, that's how the Inflation Reduction Act last year, which is really just the kind of clean energy act, ended up being passed. Um, and increasingly, Congress uh, um, 
puts more and more stuff into these reconciliation um, bills, which eventually yeah. become law. So, so in a typical year, we now see one or two really big bills passed with all kinds of stuff in them, and then maybe a few smaller uh, bipartisan bills passed. Um, there, there's a very clear trend, if you look at the number of laws passed by Congress, of uh, steady declines, really going all the way back to the 1970s. Uh, which more or less tracks perfectly with this era of slowly but steadily growing political polarization. But I want to emphasize it's not as though nothing is getting passed. So we we do have uh -huh. these reconciliation bills, and sometimes they, they include a lot of stuff. They're limited because, like I said, you can only do this once or twice a year. And also they have to include items that have some sort of taxing and spending implication. So you couldn't do something like uh, declare abortion legal again, despite the Supreme Court's decision, sure. because it doesn't it's not really a taxing or spending issue. Sure. Um, so there's 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 this. These are, I think, important caveats to the the conclusion that uh, nothing gets done by the federal government anymore. And then the other thing I want to say um, or stress, I guess, is that you know, like like we talked about before, we have a lot of state governments and also city governments. And in many cases, despite the polarization, they, uh, they're able to pass lots of things because the state is dominated by Democrats or Republicans, or the city is dominated by, well, in, in cities' case, it's almost always Democrats. Um, so they're able to pass despite the polarization, despite the, uh, the veto points. Most states have two legislative bodies and a separately elected governor, so they too have to get all these uh, these decision-making bodies to agree, but because they tend to be dominated by one or the other of the parties, they're able to pass a lot of stuff. So they can't mm -hmm. do everything. You know, states are limited uh, in part because they only have a certain amount of money to spend and in part because there are certain things only the federal government can decide. But um, I guess my, my point here is it's not all cataclysmic, um, even though there is a lot of polarization and even though I, I do think it has the potential for, uh, for really problematic consequences. Now, who knows what's going to happen over the next decade or two if, you know, if polarization accentuates and we continue to be a 50-50 country, maybe it ends up being the case that, uh, that it's just very, very difficult to pass anything because there's no more interest in compromising on anything ever again. Uh, I don't rule that out as a possibility. My best guess is, you know, maybe um, one of several things happens, which makes it easier to, to pass things at the national level. One is that one possibility is that one of the two parties gets the upper hand in a bunch of elections and so controls the government with a, a strong majority more often, like we see in a lot of the states. Um, I think the Democrats are probably more the more likely of the two to... Uh, to be in that position, mainly because of what we see with uh, the preferences of, of different cohorts. So millennials and Gen Zers are much more strongly to the left and much more likely to vote Democratic than any of the prior generations, which were much closer to 50-50 in their, their vote choices. Um, you know, it's possible they'll get a little more conservative, but the, this tendency of people to get more conservative as they age is is often overstated. The truth is that most people stick with whichever party they vote for around age 20 or so throughout their life course. Um, hmm. So if, if that happens with millennials and, and Gen Zers, um, we're likely to see a big shift to where the Democrats in, in coming decades. And that might free them up to, to pass a lot more legislation. Uh, and then, you know, probably at some point, Republicans have to moderate their views, move a little closer to the Democrats in order to get back into the, the game um, and and maybe even signal that they're more willing to to compromise. So anyway, this is all speculation. I, I really let me let me ask you a few questions just uh, for everyone to follow along. Um, so the uh, the first one is I'm trying to do something. Sorry. Um, here we go. Let me just do this real quick. So. Uh, it's different that they're passing these gigantic bills and they stuff everything in them and that's how they get things done. Isn't that because they can't discuss those issues anymore and come to an agreement? And so now 
Let's just skip these painful discussions that Congress is supposed to do. We'll have a gigantic bill and we'll slip in all of our goodies the day before. So basically everybody gets what they want without any real introspection from the public or debate. I mean, isn't that a sign of them not doing their job? Because this is relatively new. I know they didn't used to do that. Maybe they did some pork belling, but used to have more of a breakdown of we'll discuss issue X, we'll discuss issue Z. And now it's no discussion. Let's just see you get everything you want. I get everything I want. Shove it in one bill. We all pass it. The public can figure it out tomorrow what we actually passed. That's that doesn't seem good. That doesn't seem like the Congress being its traditional role for deliberation. Rather, it looks like we can't talk about anything. We can't get everybody to agree on what we're going to have for dinner. Um, let's just pick steak and shove the plates in front of their faces and they'll have to eat it. Or, or am I getting this wrong? Well, um, I'm not, I'm not certain, uh, but I think that what's happened mainly is the transformation or the, the switching of debate, discussion, deliberation, compromise, working out deals now happens almost entirely within the two parties, within the elected representatives of the, the two parties rather than between. And is that bad? I, I don't know. There are two ways of looking at this. One is that, well, you know, a democracy is about uh, uh, giving the people what they want or what's in their interest, what they voted for. And if you're in the majority at a point in time, like, for example, the Democrats had a majority in all three bodies in 2021, 2022, because of the 2020 election, it was a narrow majority, uh, uh, especially in the, the Senate, uh, but they did have a majority. And so arguably, uh, they were sent there by the people to to pass some things. And if Republicans weren't willing to negotiate or compromise, then, uh, I mean, there definitely was a lot of debate within the Democratic caucus about what exactly to do with the, the several reconciliation bills and, and plenty of compromise, especially with Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema, who, because the Democrats had such a narrow uh, majority in the Senate, had a lot of influence. They were the, the two most centrist of the, the Democratic senators. Um, and similarly, if and when the Republicans, as they did, for example, in 2017 and 18, hold all three bodies, you know, most of most of their debating was within their own caucus. So is that bad? Uh, it depends. I don't think we know the long term consequences, but I'm, I, I guess I'll say I'm a little skeptical of the notion that there's something inherently preferable about debate, discussion, deliberation across party lines as opposed to within party lines. As long as it's happening, I'm not convinced, I'm not certain that uh, there's any sort of superiority of, of cross-party discussion and compromise as opposed to just within. Okay, so and debate. So debate happened between party lines used to be something that they would do. They don't do that as much. Now the debate's within the party. So that's at least a change. We can stall the debate on if it's good or bad, but we can at least acknowledge that that's a shift. Um, yeah. I wanted to ask you uh, about the essay, but first I want to ask you a question. So I keep going like, is it bad? Is it not? Like, well, there's different ways of looking at it. So point blank, January 6th, was seen as a coup by many European leaders. They said so, terrified them, terrified many Americans. Many Americans, wow, we've never seen anything like this since 1812. Joseph Biden goes on television with a blood red backdrop to active duty Marines and says, 74 million Americans are basically enemies of the state. It's so bad that Democrats and independents are like, wow, that was pretty polarizing. We also have routine debates where both parties are like, let's take the debt ceiling to the limit to see if you'll lose this game of chicken. And I remember when they were doing it with Obama and it was seen as new and scary and now it's common practice. And then I have a poll I wanted to show you where it showed in 2021. And yes, people said this is during COVID. Okay. But there was a point in the last two years where 74% of all Biden voters and 78% of all Trump voters felt all voters of the other side were bad Americans and a clear and present danger to America. These things have not happened before in American's history, and they're relatively new. Good signs? Bad signs? 
These are new things. A lot of people are troubled by these and going, wow, this is a new scary development. Could we look at these things and say, not good? Or do we have to wait to pass judgment? Now, the, these things to me seem quite clearly bad and, and unfortunate. Um, and so this is certainly one of the consequences, I think, of the, the growing polarization. And it's accentuated very much by the fact that we have two parties here in the United States. Whenever there are two, uh, it's really clear who your opponent is. You know, if we had mm -hmm. three or four or five, we might have a lot of very clear sorting into those different camps. Um, but then it's a little bit less clear exactly who your enemy is. You know, if you're a New York Yankees fan, you know the Red Sox are the enemy and vice versa. Even right. though there are, I don't know, I don't know how many baseball teams there are. But, um, but anyway, w when you get down to two, it, it just height, tends to heighten the sense of very clear opposition, uh, tends to heighten the, the negative partisanship. Again, the, the argument or the appeal to people who maybe haven't chosen a side yet to say the reason why you should choose my team isn't because we're so good. It's because the other side is so bad or so dangerous. Right. We're not or so them. problematic or so corrupt. Um, so, yes, I think all of this has sharply increased. Uh, I don't see any way in which it's particularly good. Uh, it seems clearly bad. Exactly what the consequences will end up being, I, I don't know. Uh, January 6 was certainly really, really worrisome. Um, are things going to get worse? I don't know. I, I very much hope not. But yeah, I'm I'm in full agreement with people who think that this consequence of polarization is a, a really potentially very problematic and worrisome development. Now, uh, I, I mean, I guess I'll just as a quick caveat. I will fair. mention that back in the 18 back in the 1800s, you know, occasionally we have fist fights on the floor of Congress and lots of mudslinging and, and insults. Um, so in that, you know, very narrow respect, it's not so clear that the belligerence and hostility is brand new to American politics. But we haven't had that kind of thing for a long time. And and certainly not with a media that broadcasts it to the entire country, which, you know, along with social media, I think, uh, tends to accelerate the, the hostility and the, the sense of, of opposition and us against themism. I totally agree with what you're saying. So if there's two people in a boxing ring, folks, it's easy to go, that's the enemy. And it's easy to, what the term is called, othering. It's easy to other another person if there's only two sides. Uh, I remember reading about the Japanese people and there were the Ainu who looked differently than them. They were more of a Caucasian, Russian-based ethnic group. And the Japanese identity was based upon saying, we're not them. They're different. Whatever they are, we're not. So that's who we are. It's easy to do that. Okay, let me ask you a question I've heard from some people. Yeah, we've had bad times in the past. Civil War, really bad. And yes, there's been acrimony in Congress. I remember it was um, Adams called Jefferson a transvestite or something. I, I'm not making that up. It was It was in the newspaper. So yes, this goes way back. They were not always nice to each other, of course. What I've heard, though, is that you can compare now to the 1960s but with two understandings. One is the 1960s were much more violent than now. Kent State massacre, bombings at recruiting centers, et cetera. But this is what I've heard consistently, and I, I wanna get your opinion. Is this wrong? Is this right? The reason it's much worse now compared to the 1960s is that we have the lowest faith of the American people in 40 years in Congress, the House, the Senate, the Supreme Court, police enforcement, the FBI, the only thing, according to Pew, that Americans really have a lot of support for is the military. And we do this thing where we go, I don't think your guy won the election, so I'm going to act like he did for the next four years. Oh, yeah, I don't think your guy won the election, so I'm going to act like he didn't win for four years. They didn't do that in the 60s. People respected Congress. They respected it, had the right to issue laws. Nobody was saying, I'll defy the Supreme Court. I don't care. And nobody was walking around going, I don't think Nixon won. So I'm going to act like for the next four years, he's not really president. You didn't have anything like that in the 60s. So while it was more violent, they had at least some common institutions, some common poles to keep them together as Americans. And we've essentially lost all of that today. 
thoughts, feelings? Yeah. So, so two, two things, I guess. One is I think you're, you're spot on in the, the description of the, the differences, um, depending on what you read or the, the movies or, or old television footage you watch, you could easily get the impression that things were much worse in the 1960s, um, in part because there were a lot of demonstrations, uh, building takeovers on college campuses, kidnappings, bombings, assassinations, those kind of things for the most part don't happen today. So January 6th uh, is a, an obvious exception, but, but that today is more the exception than the rule. And between, let's say, 1968 and 72 or 73, it wasn't. This, this was quite, quite frequent. Um, but at the, at the same time, uh, distrust on the part of a significant segment of the population in government and in elections is clearly much greater now uh, than it was back in the 1960s. And so I guess let me... Let me emphasize two things, but Please. I'll conclude by saying I basically don't I don't think we know yet what to make of this. So one is you're right that trust in other people, in the government as a whole and in various political institutions, whether it's Congress, the presidency, or recently even the judiciary, everything is, as you said, except for the military and to some degree the police, um, but especially the military has declined really significantly. Um, on the other hand, a lot of that decline, um, especially trust in government and trust in other people, occurred in the 1960s and 1970s. There's been continued decline since then, but it's been much slower. And a lot of it had to do with Vietnam and Watergate, two sort of watershed events in the country's history that really transformed the way a lot of people thought about you know, how believable our elected officials are and what the government does and, and so on. So a huge drop off. It's continued, although slowed way down. But anyway, it is absolutely true that today compared to uh, any point in the 1960s, but especially, let's say, the mid 60s, there's much, much less trust in government. On the other hand, I don't feel like we know. Uh, uh, and here I'm I'm not really, I think, in the in agreement with uh, quite a lot of social scientists who seem to think that trust is really, really critical. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure we know how important trust actually is for a lot of other things we care about. I'm not suggesting that a low level of trust is a good thing at all. I just don't know that we social scientists are sure uh, whether it's really bad, and if so, how bad is it, and and for what things. So I, I just want to say we we need to know more about this before we conclude that it's hugely, hugely problematic. And then the second thing I want to mention here is it's difficult, I think, to know how much of the recent problem, especially a significant portion of the country not believing the result of the most recent election, how much of this is just a Trump phenomenon that if and when Trump passes away from the scene, will just go away. Uh, I think it, it could play out either way. It, it could be a blip that when he disappears, just goes away and most people trust elections again. Uh, you know, Richard Nixon was really paranoid, but uh, you're right. He he never, as, at least as far as I can remember or know, uh, declared that elections were um, uh, were corrupt or should be d dismissed. Uh, you know, he won the elections in 68 and 72, so he didn't have to do that. But, uh, but it, anyway, he never did. Trump did. And that's convinced a lot of Americans who want to think that Republicans are good or at least better or, or not as bad, that they should share that view. Um, so one possibility is this just goes away when, when he goes away, assuming nobody who makes the same claims pops up afterward. Another is that this is going to be a semi-permanent change or at least one that lasts, you know, for a decade or two, a generation that, that a whole significant share of Americans it's now going to be permanently imprinted upon them that they shouldn't trust election outcomes, whether their team wins or loses. And that I think, you know, I, I don't know exactly how that'll play out, but the, but if if that turns out to be the case, I, I think it could be potentially really, really problematic. The um, I think it was like the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, a lot of big mainstream left newspapers are saying it's Trump's party now. 
He's had such a big impact on him. Even if he disappeared tomorrow, uh, it's his party now. That's what they're saying. I, it's not my words. That's what they're saying. Uh, the other thing is that we can look at it as um, he was very polarizing. He was very polarizing. Um, I do want to ask you this question, though. I want to ask you about the big sort. Do we already cover that? The, no. the Have you heard of the big sort? Yeah, yes. this book by Bill Bishop. From and and do you believe so. that's real? Do you believe the big sort is a real thing? I, I think in your essay, you kind of hint that you do, that saying that the parties are somewhat more clean. Is is the big sort a real thing? Is it a real well, phenomenon? Okay, so, okay, so you, you might be asking about something else, but the, the way when, when someone says the big sort, I think of this book by, I, I think his name is Bill Bishop, the journalist yes. who wrote this okay, around 2007. And that has to do with specifically with our polarization of where we live. That is to say, more and more of us are choosing to live uh, only around lots of other people who share our political views, which may be one of the reasons why so many cities are dominated by Democrats and progressives and so many rural areas are dominated by uh, by conservatives and suburbs are a bit of a mix. But the closer you are to the downtown, the more likely you are to be progressive or, or liberal. So yeah. uh, that book made kind of a splash. And initial research, which I read a fair amount of up to, say, maybe 2015, actually suggested that um, Bishop was probably exaggerating a bit, not intentionally. He, he had just been misled by the data he had access to and that there really wasn't all this much of, the, uh, of this sort of residential sorting going on. But I honestly haven't kept up with the, the literature on this or discussion of this since then. And so it's possible that it that it is a real thing or, or has come back around. And so what Bishop concluded early on um, is now true. Um, whether he's right or wrong, it, it is very much the case that if you look at uh, inner cities compared to rural areas, there's a clear, very clear and very strong partisan difference. You know, whether that's intentionally or has to do with the fact that uh, so many college educated voters have now moved over to the left and therefore to the Democrats and they're much more likely to live in cities, whereas non-college educated have moved over to the, the conservative end of the spectrum uh, to the Republicans and they're a lot less likely to live in cities. So it could just be a, a, a fluke rather than people intentionally choosing to live close to others who share their, their political views. Uh, I but agree. in any case, it's, it's, there was a, there, I'm sorry. Um, Oh, go ahead. There was a professor, uh, Fiorina, and he criticized Bill Bishop. And what he said was, you can't conclude that everybody's moving strictly for politics. Maybe they're moving for cultural reasons. OK, I don't know if people are moving. I want to be near other Republicans or, you know, I like hats and barbecue and country music. And I just feel more comfortable over here. And the moment I get there, everybody talks a certain way. Everybody thinks a certain way. And I, just because I lived in that community, I start to absorb the way they think. Um, let me, may I show you a few maps, professor? Yeah, sure. Okay. So this is from the New York times came out in 2016. It's talking about the big sort. Um, and also let's see here. NPR covered this in 2022, 2017, 2008. Uh, 538 by uh, Nate Silver also covered this. The Sabato Center, Crystal Ball, and Wall Street Journal have all backed up the big sort, um, especially NPR. Their reporting has gone from 2012 up to 2022, and they've said, yeah, the, the trend holds. This is the map that I like to show people. So in the top left, very top left, these are landslide election counties for presidential elections. So this is at the county level. I know it's a little blurry, but this is super detailed. It's at the county level. The top left map is 1992. The bottom one that's the biggest is 2016. So in the top left map, red means don't even run here if you're not a Republican. Republicans win by 20 percentage points versus Democrats in these counties called the landslide election. Don't even try. Blue means don't even run here if you're not a Democrat. Democrats win by 20 percentage points over Republicans. Gray means it's competitive. Some years they voted for Obama. Some years they voted for John McCain. 
they were open to the message of the president and we fit fit America. And you can go from 1992 all over to 2000 and then the next line is 2004 to 2012. Anyways, you get down to 2016 at the bottom. Almost all of the competitive election counties have been wiped out. And we only have what's known as landslide election counties. This is not from Bishop. This came after Bishop from the Wall Street Journal based upon his research saying it still holds out over a 30 year period. Um, if this is true and Americans are sorting themselves, whether intentionally or unintentionally, but they're sorting themselves into these communities and it's affecting our elections. How do we fix that? Do, how do we this took 30 years and hundreds of millions of Americans to do this? How do we undo this to get back to a more moderate America? Well, so I guess I'll say two things here. One is that I think it's an open question whether it's a big problem or not. That is to say, if people are more or less choosing where they want to live based on other things, and it just happens to turn out, again, might be jobs, might be uh, weather, uh, other aspects of the culture. And it just happens to turn out that that translates into dominance by one or the other of the political parties within a, a particular region. And I'm not sure we'd want to necessarily take active steps to do anything to change that. One of the things, though, that we could potentially uh, do to change the the electoral implications of that kind of sorting would be to shift away and we really only could do this for the house of representatives but we could shift away from single member districts you, you talked about this before and the the way that we we carve our country up into districts and then mm -hmm. uh one person wins the election within each district uh if we went to a proportional representation electoral system within each state so every state would keep the same number of House of Representative seats that it currently has. But now you have statewide elections. Uh, we vote for parties. You know, the parties could put forward lists of their top candidates like they do in most other rich Democratic countries. Um, but you would vote for parties. And then, you know, if in California, the Democrats get 70 percent of the vote, they get 70 percent of the House seats. But instead of there being one seat you know, in Diane Feinstein's district and another next door in San Francisco and on and on and on, and one seat in Bakersfield, which is going to be Republican. Now, um, we, we just have a certain number of Democrats going in and a certain number of Republicans, and it doesn't matter where in the state they get their votes. Um, an additional benefit, by the way, of doing this is that it makes much more likely that a third party uh, could survive. Uh, it's really easy to create a third party in the American context, but it's almost impossible for them to last very long because it's so mm -hmm. hard to win elections. And again, you get to actually win an election to get any representation at all in the House or in the Senate or the presidency. And the, the same thing is true at the, the state level. And, and that's just very hard for a third party. So they mostly, you know, they appear, but then they either disappear or they remain tiny, tiny minorities, which, which never have any real significant influence on elections. That, I think, would be a, a, a good side effect also of, uh, of shifting to proportional representation. But anyway, um, apart from that, it's not so clear to me that, that there's something we should be trying to do to shift us back away from this uh, geographical sorting. So it's OK that traditionally for the last 200 years, most Americans had competitive elections, and now we're going to go to a future where we don't have competitive elections. Pretty much, you know who's going to win in your county. There's really no bother even running. That's what the maps are showing, is that it used to be yeah. worthwhile for a president to travel to half the country and say, vote for me. And now it's like, don't even bother. Go to your blue section or your red section. It's not even worth your time traveling to speak to those other Americans. And, and their campaigns are reflective of that. I recall... Uh, Hillary Clinton in 2016 thing lost the Rust Belt. And there was the mayor of Michigan was a Democrat and was saying, you guys have no signs up, no campaign, anything. You're doing nothing. And they're like, oh, we got it in the bag. Whole area went to Trump. Clinton team uh, figured, yeah, we don't even need to campaign there. We don't even need to talk to those people. We don't even need to try. Why? And Trump won it. And then, you know, he's not good. Uh, let me ask you another question, if I may. So a solution to polarization may be possibly naturally. I think what you're saying, tell me if I'm getting this wrong, is that one party may become larger. 
they may become a dominant share. We've had this before in American past where one party is kind of like 60, 70 percent. And so when they win, we do have a kind of a cohesive government because it's it's a strong majority. Um, I'd like to show you uh, something, if I may. This is a quote from uh, Norman Ornstein. Norman Ornstein is a demographer. Uh, he works for the Enterprise Institute. And this is something he said that I, I found disturbing. Um, I'll read it for you. Norman Orstein, I want to repeat a statistic I use in every talk. By 2040 or so, 70% of Americans will live in 15 states, meaning 30% of Americans will choose 77ers. And that 30% will be older, whiter, more rural, more male than the 70%. Unsettling to say the least. He was explaining how you can get an extreme right-wing person in the Supreme Court and how Trump could win, although losing the popular vote, and how Bush could win, although losing the popular vote. And what he's saying is um, the Constitution bakes in power to states. And even if you had 90% of the population in New York and L.A., if 35 states are conservative, it doesn't matter. They will control the presidency and the Supreme Court and the Senate, and that means they can shut down any legislation and make sure nothing gets passed that they don't like. And he's saying this trend will continue till the year 2040, according to the U.S. Census. Basically, what he's getting at is that people in Kansas and Missouri, and especially after Trump, especially after Trump, are saying, I'm a minority. I have dark skin. I don't want to go to some place that I think is racist. I'm young. You guys have no job prospects. I'm leaving. I'm an immigrant. I don't want to immigrate to someplace I think is racist. So all the young people live, all the LGBTQ people leave, no immigrants come in, and all the youth is gone. And what you have is just old people in that community who couldn't move out. And they watch mostly just Fox News. Even if we had a Democratic Party with 70, 80% of the population, what Norman Ornstein is saying is, you're still going to have Republicans control because they'll own 35 states and they can force that 70 percent to do what they want. I did an interview with um, a professor out of the USC Annenberg School of Communication. He wrote an article in L.A. Times saying this is scary as hell. We need to be prepared because what it's saying is unless we blow apart the Constitution and put it back together, it doesn't matter if Democrats have 60, 70, 80 percent. If they don't own 35 states they're not going to get what they want. How do you feel about Mr. Ornstein's predictions? Yeah, I, I think the Senate is really problematic. It's already really problematic. And if things do go in that direction, then that's going to look even worse. So in that scenario, you know, let's just say 70% of Americans are Democrats, but they're all or almost all crowded into 15 states. They're going to dominate the House of Representatives and they're going to win the presidency because of electoral college votes will shift to those states that are more populous. So the Democrat will pretty easily win the presidency, although not by quite as large a margin as the popular vote would suggest. Um, but they'll lose the Senate and the Senate is really important. And so, you know, in that kind of worst case scenario, if that were to go on for a generation, I, I suppose there's likely to be a lot of talk about a constitutional amendment. Um, how you would pass that, given that you need two thirds of the, the Senate to pass it and two thirds of the states, you know, it, it seems a logical impossibility. Uh, but maybe we begin talking about another constitutional convention or, or something along those lines. Um, so I don't, I don't pretend like I've got any, any sort of solution. I, I don't think it would be, um, the worst worst case scenario where Republicans run the show, because again, they very infrequently in, in the specific scenario that you outlined very infrequently, if ever hold the house of representatives or the presidency. But yeah, um, if they were a determined minority in the Senate, uh, or excuse me, majority in the, the Senate, they could block uh, pretty much anything from getting passed and, and the government would come to a standstill. And they would control who gets to be on the Supreme court, if I'm not mistaken. And other federal judgeships. Well, it, cases. Yeah, yeah, not the Supreme Court because the the Democrats would have the presidency probably. 
So definitely problematic. Um, okay, uh, last question I wanted to ask you um, specifically about your essay. And I tell everybody, please go look at this essay. It's super detailed. I've been talking to a lot of people and this essay was one of the most detailed out there. Um, it's Is America Too Polarized? Lane Kenworthy. You had a lot of charts. Um, there, you know, there was this one on political views, and I and it was backing up what you've been saying that the average people have not been too extreme from each other, that there's still a lot of consensus right. from the public. But I was grabbed by this section after you're going, okay, so the people aren't necessarily so polarized, but then we get to Americans haven't spread apart in their political views or their opinions and policy questions, but elected representatives in the two political parties have. Democratic Republican parties have become more ideologically cohesive. That's I think that's what you were saying. Um, here's what grabbed me. Well, ah, a more pessimistic take suggests that the problem is no longer just the Republican Party's oppositional culture. In this view, the sorting of Americans into distinct Cohesive political parties is based not only on issue preferences, but also on identities. And those identities increasingly overlap. Republicans see themselves as white, religious, rural, and male, while Democrats view themselves as racially diverse, secular, urban, and gender neutral. Evidence on group psychology suggests that in this type of scenario, group members come to care more about defeating the opposition team than about the substance of outcomes. This is a recipe for more gridlock. Americans haven't spread apart in their views on policy questions, but they've sorted themselves more cleanly into two parties. The parties have sorted into distinct groups and moved away from the center. I think that's basically a, a, a repeat of the stuff you had said before. Um, the parties are more polarized and cleanly separated, but not necessarily the people. But I think this gets at, you know, if these parties are so polarized, how, how are we going to have moderate legislation? I mean, e even if the people are moderate and even if the people say we all agree, these parties are so cleanly polarized and so opposite from each other. Is there any chance for moderate legislation that the people actually want to make it to the top? Yeah, so that, I mean, that's a, a an interesting and hard question. And so one way to approach this would be to look at the states where one or the other party rules the roost. So in California, for example, in California, the state legislature, together with the governor, a little more under Gavin Newsom than was the case under Jerry Brown, has been passing a lot of things that Democrats all over the country would like to see happen. Uh, I don't think it's nearly as moderate as much of the country uh, uh, would probably choose. Um, but similarly, in the number of uh, Republican dominated states. I mean, you can see this now with legislation um, for transgender teenagers on abortion, on a variety of other things. They're passing legislation that is certainly outside what moderates across the country would want to see. You know, is that bad or good? Well, it, it depends on your perspective. Democrats in California are certainly doing what Democratic voters in California, or at least many Democratic voters, yeah. would like to see done. And the the legislature and governor in the conservative states are doing what many of their voters would like to, to see done. Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think there are arguments both ways. I, I completely agree with you that it's worrisome, potentially problematic, but I, I, I haven't fully made up my mind uh, at this moment about how problematic it is. Fair. And I think this will also, you know, in, in ways that we've kind of talked about or at least hinted at, it depends a bit on where we go from here. You know, does this continue right. to get worse over the next decade or two or or does it itself moderate uh, a little bit? And I, I really don't know the answer. I've been convinced for at least 10 or 15 years that Republicans at some point were going to pull back from their uh, really sharp oppositional stance and be a little more willing to, you know, they were going to move a little bit away from Newt Gingrich, but, you know, instead exactly the opposite has, has happened. I didn't predict Donald Trump um, or, or what he would do. Uh, I, I didn't think that was very likely, but I was wrong. 
you had mentioned that this approach began with Newt Gingrich and it has been accentuated by organizations. I had, I had heard a story that, um, you know, traditionally people in Congress would argue with each other during the day in front of the cameras, but their wives knew each other. And so every night they'd have dinner and they'd kind of talk with each other. When Newt Gingrich came along, he said, no hanging out with the other party after hours. And that that was a stark change and probably something that led to our polarization. Is that is that what you're talking yeah. about or is it some other thing? Yeah, I think it I think it hastened it. No, that's exactly what I what I was talking okay. about. So Gingrich, my understanding is that Gingrich actually came up with this strategy, not because he wanted to see more polarization, but because he thought that was the smartest way for Republicans to eventually win, the you know, take back the House of Representatives when he was first elected in the late 70s. Democrats had had a majority in the House since the mid 50s, you know, 20 years. And so he's in he's in and the Democrats continue to win through the 80s. This is partly because, the you know, the, the Democrats had been a successful party in the middle of the 20th century, but also because there's a strong incumbency advantage. And then Watergate sort of continued their advantage. Anyway, Gingrich yeah. thought the way we Republicans eventually get a majority in the House is to essentially shut the government down. We're not popular enough to win elections on our policy proposals but if we if we stop the government from doing anything people will blame the majority which at that time was the democrats mm. and so he said our smart strategy our path to power is to just make sure nothing gets passed at all and you know eventually uh, by the time he had ascended the ladder within the the republican house caucus in 1994, they finally won the majority, and and that seemed to more or less vindicate his strategy. I don't know if, in fact, that was the thing that eventually led Republicans to, to winning back the House. But anyway, uh, ever since, that's ha exerted a pretty strong influence on Republican Party political culture, kind of in the same way that you know, Reagan's approach to taxation, because he won a landslide reelection became part of Republican Party political culture. Whoever's successful at a particular moment tends to exert some influence in terms of what their strategy was for you know a decade or a generation, uh, even after they reached the, the height of their influence. So Gingrich's oppositional approach became you know, something close to dogma within Republican Party uh, elite circles. And I do think that, and I don't think it was the underlying cause of the polarization, but I do think it, it helped heighten uh, and probably accelerate the polarization, especially among the elected representatives of the, of the two parties within the House and within the Senate. I really appreciate that, Professor. I brought this point up. You're the first person I've met who can back it up. Yeah, he did that. It happened. Is it the cause of everything? I don't know, but it's at least the data point. Um, we're winding down. Is there anything you wanted to ask us? Is there anything you wanted to talk about in specific? Do you have any questions? Was there something you wanted to say and you didn't feel you had the opportunity to say it? Want to no, make sure. I think uh, I think I've actually said almost anything I <laughs> uh, I have to to offer. And you know, if, if people are interested in learning more, like you said, they could go read this this piece that I've written. Um, but no, this say. is uh, this has been fun. I hope you feel this wasn't gotcha journalism. It was just a straightforward interview. Um, if you know anybody who's willing to be part of this conversation, you don't have to say now. I'll email you a copy of the video. We'd love to keep the conversation going. So if you know anybody, left, right, whatever, and you feel that we were fair, we'd love to talk to them. Last question that I ask everybody. Picture you're not you and you're not me. You're a third person. You don't really know this person. And they're watching this video and they're going, wow, it's great. So much material, but a little bit hard to take it all in. And I'm struggling to remember everything they said. But, you know, this professor they had on said this one thing. And it's five days later after I watched that video. But I can't get this one thing this professor said out of my head. What is the thought you want a random unknown person to not be able to stop thinking five days from now after they watch this interview? Uh, okay, so what I would choose, let me preface by saying that that it's it's because I think so much of the discussion now probably is rightly focused on the dangers and harms and bad consequences of polarization. So I guess the one thing that I would probably pick to say is it's more complicated than that. I don't think we know for sure 
that this is going to be all bad. So keep in mind that we need to keep thinking, keep discussing, keep talking, keep analyzing, uh, and not just assume uh, that we're headed for the, the worst case scenario. Okay. I, I appreciate that. Thank you so much for coming out. I'll send you a copy of this. If you know anybody else, we'd love to keep the conversation going because we think it's an important topic. It's worthy of discussion, right? Agreed. Absolutely. All right. We'll end it there. Thank, Thank you. you for coming out and I'll send you a copy soon. Thank you, Professor. Okay. You bet. Thank you.